Hello. How are you? It's your friend, Larry Singleton here. Is my dick and balls showing too much there? I gotta pull up my... <laughs> so, I am here to... I, I haven't made a video on here in like a year. I've done many things with my life since then. I have grown. I have matured as a person. I have purchased property in Europe. I have a wife who's six foot two and Dutch and blah, blah, blah. All the things you know I'm going to talk about if you know me already. All my dreams just came true in the last 12 months. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm still a loser. Still living in the uh, parents' basement. I'm still rocking the yellow glasses that make me look like Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm still D-R-E. I'm still D-I-L. Alright. I don't think these glasses make me look like Jeffrey Dahmer. Do they? I don't think so. I wear them because I have a bit of a sensitivity to light these days. They're good for, you know, changing one's mood and shutting out the world out of your heart. But anyway. Yeah, I don't think they make me look like Jeffrey Dahmer. I think the stigma these days is gone. Everyone can kind of tell. If you wear glasses that look like this, you're not a murderer or a pedophile. You're just, you got some kind of issue. <laughs> that doesn't make it sound any better. You got some kind of issue. By the way, funny story I was reading about Jeffrey Dahmer recently. Because I'm doing research about where I want to take the next step of my life. When people bully me for wearing glasses. <laughs> Just because I want to do research and I want to know how did, how did these guys mess up. Because I want to know how to do it properly. I'm going to be the first guy to get it right. No, I'm kidding. No, I was. Re I, I want to read. I wanted to read about why. It seemed to me that the serial killer stories. There's more to the surface. I feel like a lot of these guys were allowed to get away with stuff. You know, in every case, there's always some detail where the police lost evidence. Ted Bundy was just allowed to escape prison at one point. <laughs> I don't think they would let me do that if I was, you know, wanted for a crime. You think I'd be like Ted Bundy? You think they would allow me to somehow leave prison and then escape into the woods, into a cabin that was just mysteriously furnished with food and water and love and shelter and everything a human being needs. You think they would allow me to do that? I don't think so. But anyway, the story that I just just came to mind right now is... Uh, uh, <laughs> this made me laugh. If you have a dark sense of humor, it might make you laugh too. So at one point, Dahmer... This is, you know, in the stage where he was doing all the stuff, this is... Not at the height of his fame. This is when he, when the government was allowing him to do all this stuff. Because, as we all know, the government allows serial killers to commit their crimes. Because they are all programmed to... Okay. If you know, you know. But anyway. At one point, uh, Dahmer was caught... Or he got in trouble for uh, exposing himself to two young boys. And the cr the fine for this, this is what made me laugh, was $42. <laughs> so that's like $21 a boy. It's a pretty good deal if you think about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But that is that story is true. He was He did this stuff... And then he was just fined $42. It's just such a weird... <laughs> I, I couldn't get that story out of my head when I read it. Reddit. Speaking of murder and pedophiles. Reddit. Everyone on there. <laughs> That's all I need to say. <laughs> okay. 
so why did I bring... How did Jeffrey Dahmer... Oh, yeah. In the last 12 months, I've done a lot of things with my life. I have traveled. I'm still a loser. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, y y you can see here. You got the Tarantino poster. The childhood bedroom. Baby blue... Baby blue paint. I'm still very much in the same place that I was at uh, 12 months ago when I was making videos for three unhinged mentally ill people to watch. <laughs> so yeah, very much in the same place. But uh, in, in the past 12 months, I did manage to do a couple of productive things with my time. I traveled to Europe. I gained some insights. I am not married to a Dutch six foot two woman. Like I always joke about. Yet. <laughs> and then the other things that I did. I wrote a book. I wrote two books. Okay. They're only available in the written form page form like it's the 1800s i know i get it nobody reads books anymore nobody likes to read people don't have the energy everyone's broke everyone makes two potatoes and a bean an hour doing stuff they already don't like and then everywhere you go people are asking you for money and you have none you go to the supermarket, and the girl at the store is like, Uh, hi. I can see that you're using coupons to buy stuff, so you're poor, but my employer is making me ask you this anyway. Would you like to donate toonies for tots? Would you like to donate for toonies for tummies for tots? It's the program where we take one ninety eight out of every $2 that you give us. And we keep it for the employees, for ourselves. And we give two cents to the tots. Would you like to donate, <laughs> even though you're poor? Okay, I got off track there. But you get my point. I get it. I get, I get it. Everyone's poor. You don't have money to spend. I get it. No one reads. No one has the energy it's just a it's just not a hobby that is very much in anymore. And if you do read, you're using the library, you're downloading PDFs, you are uh doing other things. That being said, I this video I, this this video was supposed to be me introducing this project and it just went completely off the rails. Because I talked about <laughs> stuff that has nothing to do with anything. Murder. Jeffrey Dahmer. What was I going to say? Oh, yes. So I understand. No one wants to buy books or support that in that kind of manner. However, I decided to record about, I think it's like an hour, of audio of me reading the book. One of the books that I wrote. So what this is is just me reading the audio. It's not the full book because I do not have I don't have the time to do that. But what I did was I recorded one hour, and if you like it, there you go. If if there's enough, you know, if people seem to like it. The two or three people that watch my channel. I know no one watches anyway. Or listens or whatever. But if people do seem to like it. Of the small few. That like. <laughs> my channel. Then maybe I'll keep recording. As a little treat. As a little gift to you. But. Um, so some of the differences. The, I had fun reading it. But I noticed the it's not the same experience if you read it like on the written in in the written form some of the jokes translate differently and when i read it back to you 
I riff and I do certain things. I make shit up on the spot too. So it's a different experience. So if you have bought the book, you can still listen and it'll be a fun new type of experience for you. You'll learn a lot about life. So what is the book? I should have said that before, but this is very disorganized. The book that I'm reading from, I wrote two, remember. Two. <laughs> I, I wrote two books last uh, summer, year, whatever. Basically what it is, I walked around giving a collection, uh, uh, just just taking a collection of my thoughts and just ideas and jokes that came to my head. I mean, where else would it come? I don't know why people say it came to my head. It came on my face. It came to my head. I talk about a lot of various things. There's some jokes. There's some stories. There's some essays. Just a variety of things, okay? Both books are 100,000 words of this format. So, anyway, that's the introduction. How long was this? This is 10-minute introduction, so eh, I should end the video now. Um, yeah, if you like the book, I would recommend buying it, but I know that everyone's poor and depressed and on drugs and smoking marijuana that the government has made legal because they want you to zombify yourself. They want you to sit in a stupor and masturbate to online pornography where a woman who lost her parents at the age of four years old is being double homicided in 4K. They want you on edibles while you watch this stuff. We're in a spiritual and psychological war right now, okay? So if you want to be <laughs> on the losing end of the spiritual and psychological war, by all means, take a 200 milligram edible that is legal from the government, hop on the hubs, and get to work, my friend. But if you do not want to do that, what I would recommend is meditate, exercise, read books. It doesn't even have to be my books. It doesn't have to be my books. Does that make sense? They don't even have to be my books. But, um, yeah, reading is a very important thing. So do make sure you do it. Do it up. I'm trying to remember what else I had to say here. I guess that's about it. The, the books on Amazon are like, I think they're like 25 bucks each. And, yeah, if you like this, I will continue to record... If you don't like it, I might continue to record again because I like to bother people. And that's pretty much it. That's all I had to say today was read the books, buy the books, listen to the audio books for free. We're in a spiritual and psychological war. So put good things in your heart, okay? Now... Someone made a comment on one of my videos before that said, uh, I want to support you, but I I don't like the way you post videos. You don't edit. I prefer people that edit their videos and blah, blah, blah. Listen, first of all, shut up. <laughs> Second of all, perfect is the enemy of good. You know who said that? A gay French man by the name of Voltaire. But you know who else said that? A straight brown man by the name of Delaire. Or should I say Larry Singleton. Perfect is the enemy of good. So if you don't like my videos and they're not edited enough for you, then um, I don't know what to say. I don't really care. This is just for, like I said, I've said this a million times. It, this is for the three or four people that watch my videos. And I think that's that's about it. I just wanted to introduce what you're about to hear. It's not video of me 
uh, reading. It's just audio. So what you should do is get, put on a nice little robe, make some hot cocoa, settle in with a furry friend, a brown guy, <laughs> not a pet, <laughs> a furry friend, <laughs> and listen to this. All right, that's about enough. This is 15-minute introduction in which I talked garbage. Hopefully, this does not betray your interest in any manner. Just just hear me out, okay? That's it. Buy my book when I'm dead. One of the funniest cruel little facts of art is that if you are an unpopular artist and you kill yourself or happen to die young in some kind of tragic accident, you will then become popular. But it'll only be after you've already died and cannot benefit from this in any way. People have a weird, morbid fascination with death and really seem to relish the supporting of artists, but only after they're dead. People rarely support great artists when they're alive. That's just how it works. Even if you're not a great artist, if you happen to die, people will take you and your work more seriously. If you want to be a famous artist, make sure you die first. No one knows. People can make all kinds of predictions about stuff. There are economists and all types of different so-called paid experts who claim to know what is happening. Some people get paid thousands of dollars just to predict what they think is going to happen. Some people speak and give long speeches for entire rooms full of people who are eager to listen to what this person has to say. We listen to our parents growing up, our teachers, our religious leaders, the police, the news. Everywhere you go, everyone has an opinion about at least one thing, and they think they are all right. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking so much about it, would they? People will look at you in the face and give you advice about stuff they've probably never even done themselves, just so they can look like they know. People are more likely to pretend to know something than admit that they simply do not know anything about anything. Because to admit you are merely just a human being is somehow considered, considered wrong or embarrassing. To admit that you might be just as dumb as everyone else is seen as a bad thing, and no one wants to be thought of as dumb or possibly wrong. Everyone thinks they have the answers about at least one thing some of the time. But does anyone really know? Even me. What if this whole aphorism is just nonsense, and I don't even know about knowing? Maybe everyone knows something. Or not. Who really knows about knowing? Who knows where the wind is blowing? I think sometimes life is not about knowing anything at all, really. It's just about knowing that you do not know. I think I respect people who are self-aware about not being in the know more than people who think they're in the know. You know? Equal amounts of contempt. I can't be racist because I have an equal amount of contempt for everyone. When it comes to misanthropy, I'm a communist. There's enough for each person. No one gets left behind in my system. No one is the main character of anything. No group is the main character of anyone. We're all background characters. In fact, we're not even good enough to be background. We're not even extras. We're just nothing. Everyone is nothing. Just bugs and worm people. More on the worm people later on in the book.
Psychological Rape Much has been made of physical rape because it is obviously the more blatant and violent form of it. But sometimes I do wonder if this is actually true. In the modern world, sometimes I feel that I'm being raped every day of my life, but no one notices or cares because it is not physical, it is psychological. It is the trespassing of your personal peace without even touching you, the noise you are forced to listen to when you enter a store that they call music. It is the loud and abrupt fart sound in an advertisement for a car you will never be able to afford that cuts off the YouTube lecture you're watching about a very serious and philosophical subject. It is the amber alert on your phone that you did not personally consent to, informing you that some child you had nothing to do with, who lives nowhere near you, has been abducted by his alcoholic stepfather for the 40th time that month. All of these are spiritually damaging to the soul in the same way a real, physical, traditional rape would be in an alley somewhere or something like that. But there is no support group for this type of rape because it's all deemed appropriate under the hell we're all living in. There will be no Me Too movement for those of us who prefer to sit in silence and are audibly harassed by co-workers regaling the tales of what their dogs did the previous evening or what happened in traffic that day. I would argue that this slow, everyday torture is just as bad as a real, stereotypical Jodie Foster pinball machine type rape. But people are convinced it is normal and we have no choice but to live under it. We have normalized the absolute worst, and now every day we have to be okay with the fact that if you walk into a bookstore, they can't even give you the decency to quietly leaf through what you want to purchase before you purchase it. They, they make it like Vegas in there, and you gotta hear some horrendous song that has nothing to do with anything you wanted to read about. You gotta hear Michael Bolton or Brian Adams or Tom Sawyer by Rush. Sorry, there's not a more modern reference because all my knowledge stops at a certain point and I try not to pay attention to uh, current culture for my health anymore. So you have to hear all of this music when all you wanted to do was have a peaceful read. And God forbid you want a cup of coffee in the cafe attached to the bookstore, you will be psychologically tortured even more, with even worse, different music. It's like they're having a competition at the combination bookstore cafe place. Who can play the worst music for their patrons? The only recourse you have is to fight fire with fire. Jam earphones into your ear holes, forcefully, against your will, and blast music you prefer instead. Even though you never even wanted to listen to anything in the first place, you now have to pretend you're happy with your ear holes being fucked by the world. How is that any different than a real rape? Your ear holes and a pussy hole are the same thing, but sound is not tangible like a cock is. So they're getting away with raping us all every single day. It's a spiritual and psychological war that we're fighting. I personally hate it here. North American life sucks ass and it's getting worse every, <laughs> every passing year. When people talk about how bookstores are going away because of online retailers, I think to myself, good. I hope it happens, just so I don't have to suffer ear rape in stores anymore. I don't know how many more times in my life I can hear Tom Sawyer by Rush while trying to read a book. Reincarnation within life. 
I have often felt that reincarnation is real, not in the traditionally described sense, but in the way that it is within the very same lifetime itself. What I mean by this is that each period of your life has certain stages. There is a life cycle of each part of life, and you can detect it being born or ending if you observe very closely, such as times where you lose a close loved one, or if you happen to suffer another similar type of tragedy. These are the obvious reincarnation periods of life, because you change as a person almost immediately. But then, there are also the slow changes that occur. The ones that are happening all the time that you do not see. Your health, for example, is constantly getting worse day by day. Until one day, you are officially at old age. No one knows what age is officially old age. Yet we all agree that this happens. This is a perfect manifestation of reincarnation within life. The old you is disappearing and replaced with a different person constantly, and you don't always notice when it occurs. You're not who you were yesterday, and that person isn't the same as who you were two weeks ago, and so on. People think you have to fully die to be reincarnated but you're probably being reincarnated all the time, and you don't even realize it. Zero swag. People talk a lot about fast fashion these days. It is the process wherein a big company will figure out some fashion trend people seem to like, and then figure out a way to mass produce said thing for as cheaply as possible for as many of their stores as possible. What this means is that the high-quality clothing of the past just isn't there, and these clothing items don't last very long. In the past, real fabrics were used, like wool, cotton, and leather. Today, if you have to buy a pair of jeans, you are likely to find things that are half spandex, half polyester, and only a tiny little bit of cotton, if at all. It is very funny to me, that we now live in the so-called future, yet we can't even dress ourselves as well as people in the past. There's a reason why there's a market for vintage clothing, and it's because fast fashion has zero swag whatsoever beyond a couple of wares. I can always tell immediately when something is comprised mainly of polyester or pleather, and it is very ugly to me. Boomers got it all. Money, jobs with upward mobility, housing, and now they are taking fashion from us. We have been robbed of fashion. Zero swag too. A very obvious thing to point out is that the typical man with a suit and tie simply does not exist anymore as the norm. Or a woman dressing in a dress and heels. Nowadays, when people wear these types of outfits, it is out of the ordinary. A guy who wears a suit every day now isn't seen as an adult like how adults of the past were. If a guy wears a suit, people start to wonder what the occasion is, or think he has to be going to a wedding or a job interview. People just don't dress up for no reason anymore. And if they do, They're seen as quirky or some other type of personality defect reason that has nothing to do with that outfit being their actual wardrobe. I think the reason why the hoodie has become the new suit and why tech guys have made it the new norm is because we simply have no self-respect anymore. Men of the past used to take themselves seriously. Today, everyone kind of knows that we're doomed, and living in the worst time ever, of degrowth and so on. And it has bled into how people view themselves. Why put in an effort if you can die any day now? Why act like it's madmen when there's no upward mobility anymore anyway? What are you really trying to do? 
What are you trying to signal with your clothing? Are you going to try to get a raise at the end of the world? Are you going to try to spend money on the last sinking ice cap or something? Just put on a hoodie and be an oafish blob like everyone else. Because that's what's normal and cool now. Zero Swag 3 You can see the zero swag concept and how everyone is the same, not just with fashion, but ideologically, in general, now. It used to be that there would be different types of people, but now everyone feels more or less the same. It doesn't matter what race or gender people are. Everyone is just kind of the same. There's, there aren't any really extreme differences between people, is what I'm trying to say here. They all talk about the same things. They're angry about either one thing or the other. They all watch the same content from the same algorithm. And no one really has any new perspectives. It doesn't feel like there are any new kinds of people out there anymore, because there aren't really. The internet has sort of democratized everything. Even if someone feels unique or new to you, chances are you can probably learn everything they know, too, within a couple hours and a quick Google search. Even if someone seems like a mystery to you, you can just learn everything about them in about 5 or 10 minutes, and they're not as cool anymore to you. It's almost like people were once all part of the same sort of amorphous blob, and then they got atomized somehow, and now everyone's split off into different areas, but we're still part of the, the that same blob. You can see this clearly when you travel. The teenagers in Europe do the same thing as the teenagers in North America. The adults argue about the same trivial politics and stuff that don't really matter. The strikes that won't change anything are the same. People like to say stuff about how the French are good at revolting and they do protests, right? But people are really just sort of the same all over and collapsing in the same manner all over when you look at it. Everyone's atomized, yet no one is an individual because people have become all the same. There aren't any unique points of view because we all share the same view. The phone. That sounds kind of boomery to say, but it's true. My number one hater. I live to make all my haters mad. I have so many. But you want to know who the greatest hater of all time is? It is God. I know it's cool to say you're going to end your life and stuff these days, and suicide is really funny. Suicide booths are really being pushed by the mainstream media these days. But for me personally, I simply refuse to go down that route. It's a matter of revenge. You hear that, big man upstairs? I'm going to live out this prison sentence fully. You can't, you can't stop me, bro. <laughs> Your options. Should you date a fat, unattractive, plain girl who is very boring and does not make you laugh at all? Or should you go for the insane cocaine girl who is hot as hell, but insane? These are your choices if you are a man in the 2020s looking to date. That's pretty much it. A woman you are not attracted to, who you can probably build a boring future with. Or a beautiful woman who might make you, and probably herself, die of a heart attack. Any way you slice it, you are doomed. Sometimes, I feel bad about being alone and a Dostoevsky figure. And, by the way, more on the Dostoevsky figures later on in the book. But then, I think it really may be the best option for a guy like myself. I might not ever get married and have children. 
but it's like I'm married to my own loneliness and spirit. The arguments and the conversations I would have with a wife, like a regular man, are just my inner thoughts. Both options take a lot of energy. Either way, I think I'm making the right choice. Cannibalism is working. I just love the system of cannibalism. I think it works perfectly well, and the youth of today are just immature and they need to grow up. If they don't like how the system works, that's just tough beans. In my day, we woke up at 4 a.m. to participate in cannibalism. I worked my way up the mailroom, and before I knew it, I was munching on the CEO's leg by the time I was 24. I was eating secretaries for breakfast. I was eating their limbs with ketchup and Tabasco sauce. I just loved eating people. Some people say it's immoral when we have access to real food, but I don't even care. I love it. The system of cannibalism works perfectly. If it doesn't work for you, you're just not a hard eater. Oh, whoops. I'm just rereading this now. I didn't realize my error. Spell check. My bad. <laughs> I meant to, I meant to, uh, it should have, it should have been capitalism. My mistake. Same thing, though, really, if you think about it, though, eh? Ha <laughs> ha! Himself. Something you might notice in this book after a while is that I always use the male gender as the example of stuff when I'm talking about something. And I never say stuff like he or she or himself or herself and so on. The main reason for this is not because I am intolerant or somehow have some dumb belief that women cannot do the same jobs as men or whatever other nonsense people get angry about. It is simply because it makes for very uneconomic writing to slow myself down in such a manner. And I do not wish to say stuff like he, her, they, them, and you know, because that's making other people influence my work or alter my voice in some way, which I refuse to do. I don't believe in bending my will for other people, but rather the other way around. I am bending reality to fit my needs. The thing about bending to fit other people's needs is that the people who want you to bend will not stop there. Once they see that you have bent over, they will continue to sodomize. Now, another reason I am being so obstinate about this is because I find it gives my writing an older quality you typically find in books by dead philosophers, which I kind of like. It is always refreshing to me when you pick up an older book in a library and the year it was published says 1924 or something like that. You leaf through it and there are outdated words no one uses anymore. It's amusing to me to think that what was normal always changes and it's like a living document that you can see the proof of. So for example... At one point, people were going around saying stuff like, a colored man. And then, because that becomes offensive, it changes to Negro. Or vice versa. Maybe it changed from the latter to the former. Because of how frequently language changes, even the correction becomes bad. And then, the correction becomes offensive. So what was good becomes bad, colored, becomes offensive, and so on. This male gender language choice is just my way of making things come full circle and taking things back to square one. So if you find this book in the year 2080, please note that it was published in the 2020s, not in the 1900s, and that this is not acceptable in my time, which makes it funnier. The humor might be lost on you at that point in the future, though, because people might be calling each other XYZ and weird shit like that in your time. Another reason why I'm doing it this way, and I'm not 
being inclusive to every single type of person. Aside from uneconomic writing and slowing myself down, the main an, another big reason is that I have noticed an overall hypocrisy among women in that they never seem to correct the example given when it's a bad one. So for example, they might correct something like uh, a doctor who is a man. They might say, why did you say he for the doctor example there? Women can be doctors too. But they would never correct the same example if it happens to paint them in a negative light. So for example, if someone is a serial killer, or if someone is being a whiny little bitch, they might not ask you to correct it to a woman because it'll make them look bad. <laughs> And finally, the other reason why I'm using male-centered language instead of complicating things with clunky language so everyone feels good is because I do not think everyone should feel good. I think feeling bad is fine. Some people tend to forget that you're supposed to feel bad from time to time. So that's my goal. I want to make more people who should feel bad feel bad. It also makes me laugh to bother people sometimes. So anyway, that's the explanation. If you want more gender inclusive language in a book, you should probably write your own book and I would be happy to not read it. Good luck. Simu who? It is funny to me that people tried to cancel the actor Simu Lu over old Reddit posts he made in which he claimed to be sympathetic towards pedophiles due to doing research for a role and understanding them more and comparing uh, their situation to homosexuality. Now, I personally do not like him as an actor, because he annoys me, and I do not wish to see more of his face in my life. And I'm also bitter, because I think I'm very talented, but also very unlucky. And I resent anyone who makes more money than me, who I feel should not be a success. But I thought this was funny, for two reasons. One, this is a perfect example of how Gen Z tries to cancel people in an indirect, feminine way, where you didn't even really do anything wrong necessarily, they just don't like you and try to get you in trouble over something that wasn't even immoral or illegal. It was just something weird you said. It's like they hated him so much, which again is understandable, because I do not like him either, and I'm not judging anyone for trying to cancel someone because they dislike them. They were just looking for something to get rid of him over. Like a girl trying to figure out how to break up with her bad boyfriend, but couldn't figure out how to do it in a reasonable sounding way. And two, it's funny that his comments on pedophilia of all things is uh, what they tried to get him in trouble over because his employers are all wealthy CEOs. If anything... The viewpoint people were trying to make him look bad for would probably be appreciated by his employers. As we all know, rich people are notorious for liking that kind of stuff. And rich people are the ones putting Simu Lu in movies. It makes no sense that they would try to get him fired over that kind of stuff when his employers probably love it. They probably heard about it and called him into the office, like, Simu, my man, we didn't know you rolled like that. What are you doing this Friday, dog? You want to hit up the island with us? Epstein's gone, but the party's still going on until the break of dawn. We got dungeons now, dog. We'll fly you back out in time for hair and makeup on Monday. Don't even trip, homie. <laughs>
liberal white girl. I was talking to this liberal white girl one time, and she said something about how white women are o oppressed also due to gender. But then she went on to say that because they are white, they are also the oppressor first and foremost, which I thought was a very interesting dynamic, and I never thought about this before. And then I said to her, wow, that's so true. Whatever you say, lady. <laughs> oppress me, mommy. <laughs> Let's take turns oppressing each other. I'll oppress you as a man and a woman. And you can oppress me as a white lady and a brown guy. We'll just switch places every night so it's fair. We'll just take turns oppressing each other. <laughs> Gen Z cancels Marx. Hey, did you hear the news? Marx is no longer cool among young people. Gen Z doesn't understand context, and they found old writings by Marx in which he used racial slurs to describe someone. In their quest to make everyone the bad guy, it seems as if they have turned on their own hero. What a twist. I mean, Gandhi was a surprise to me, too. But I never saw this Marx stuff coming. I thought they loved the guy. I guess that's just what happens when Gen Z is on the case. They will Google until they're blue in the face and find the one time you used the N-bomb in college or whatever and they'll write you off as a person completely. Oh well. Between you and me though, I gotta say, I still think Marx was a pretty interesting thinker. He had some good ideas. The Communist Manifesto is still a pretty interesting work. It's too bad they had to find out he was a racist. So much for class solidarity, I guess. If you're racist, then you're just racist. It doesn't matter if you popularized a whole philosophy that might, ironically, help the group that you were racist against. Oh well. Just the tip. I had to break things off with my girlfriend last night. I kept noticing that every time I wanted to make that sweet, sweet love to her, she would always ask me for a tip. At first, it was fine, and I understood why she would ask. But then it became constant. Literally every single time we would make that sweet, sweet love, she would ask for a tip, and she would get really aggressive too. 5%? 10%? 20%? 25%? custom tip please please for the love of god just a tip i need a tip so i can pay my bills please press the button to cancel the tip oh whoops sorry not no not that button i meant the other one the one you pressed makes you put in the whole thing that's not a tip that's your whole life savings whoops my bad ha <laughs> ha now i am broke living destitute on the streets, and my ex-girlfriend is living off of all my money, all because she wanted just a tip. The Seagulls The other day, I was in a parking lot waiting for a movie to start. I was smoking a hand-rolled cigarette with half tobacco and half a gram of Moroccan hash to relax before the movie. I like doing this instead of smoking regular weed sometimes, because the nicotine gets me focused and re-energized, and the hash relaxes me a little without getting me too high to properly concentrate and enjoy the movie. It's really the best of both worlds, something to take the edge off while also retaining full concentration levels. As I got to the last portion of it, the unexpected happened. A lady pulled up beside me at the parking lot and got out of her car. She then retrieved a plastic bread bag that looked old and nearly empty. Then, she walked over to the group of seagulls in the parking lot and started throwing handfuls of whatever it was she had in that empty Wonder Bread baggie. It appeared to be some kind of actual bird food, not leftover breadcrumbs, but bird food 
she bought specifically for this purpose. After a couple minutes of this, the lady went back to her car, drove off, and left me and the seagulls there in the aftermath of this weird decision. I did not really care for this moment at the time it was happening, because the woman had slightly interrupted and ruined my peace and contemplation. But the more I thought about it later, the more I enjoyed it overall. I liked it because of how it made me run the gamut of emotions in such a short span of time. I went from being alone, contemplative, to surprised, slightly fearful, curious, shocked, a little scared, and finally relieved. Collateral Capital I saw this dead girl in a car crash on the way to work this morning. Her car was a complete wreck. She had slammed into a truck. There was debris all over the damn highway, and the front half of her car was crumpled up. It looked like someone balled up a piece of tin foil or something. Now, I'm not the type of person who stares at tragedies on the highway, because I generally mind my business and keep to myself, and I just want to get to work. But traffic was moving so slowly that morning, I had no choice but to take a look. I was confronted with the morbidity. They put a thin white sheet over her body, which was most likely dead, but I couldn't really tell. And they just left her there, waiting for the next step in the process of whatever it is they do. Her little Ugg boots were sitting outside the car, just another casualty of capitalism. The cruel irony of this is that I bet she was on her way to work or some other dumb thing she probably didn't even want to be doing that morning. And now she's dead. The fun. It's important to keep silliness in your life. One should treat silliness and whimsy with the utmost importance. The act slash art of being silly is incredibly important, very meaningful. Some say it's necessary to devise a system or set of rules in order to manage chaos. That is true, but it is also true to recognize the complete absurdity and meaninglessness of any system you might invent. The very nature of a system is silly. Rather than conquering silly, one must join it, own it, and be proud to be part of the absurdity you were born into. Like a water droplet landing into a cup of water. It was always part of that liquid to begin with. You're just going home. The goal is to reunite with the nonsensical nature of life, being harmonious with this great retardation around us. Candy Store I like to go to the candy store near my home. It's a special European place that has lots of stuff you can't find anywhere else. In fact, it's better than being in any one place in Europe due to how much variety there is. I go about once a month and get lots of different types of chocolates, cheeses, bread, and coffee. It is wonderful. I keep it in my life as a matter of religion. It's for my health and one of the reasons to be alive. I would strongly suggest everyone do this, or at least have something like it, that isn't harmful to your health, I mean relatively speaking, and it's just dumb fun. You need something in your life that's a reason to leave your home and get up in the morning that isn't work, family, or anything serious. Just life for the sake of fun. There doesn't always have to be a great big event or grand purpose. The important thing can also be dumb. 
greatness. We talk about the flow state a lot. Many people talk, few understand it. This is because only great men can get there. It's not for everyone. It is considered the highest possible level of creating, attainable, if you're an artist. The flow state is highly coveted and revered by people who will never get there, and people who think they have gotten there. It is where the great works come from. Great men know intuitively that real art, the great works, all come from beyond, not by the actual name on the final piece. It's not who you think. Real art is never by the author it says on the cover. It comes from beyond, another place entirely. This greatness comes from another realm. It is less about having ownership over your work and more about being a custodian of your health and mind, being ready for greatness when it hits you like a truck, listening to the universe when it's calling out to you. Sometimes it does that, but most people are too stupid to hear it. It's about allowing yourself to be taken over, possessed by a spirit of art, using you as a host. You are not the author, you are just the channel for what it wants to be and say to the rest of the world. Be grateful, you are the one chosen, but don't be prideful because you really did nothing other than accept the call. The greatness is a jolt of energy in which you try to capture lightning in a bottle. It is that which is impossible, the attempt at catching all of something, as it is in the process of slipping away from you. It is disappearing from thin air while you are catching it. This is why great art is great. Whatever that was able to be captured in such an impossible manner should be deemed a miracle by default. In order to achieve this state, one must focus on the possibilities, never the limits. It is about momentum, being the snowball that never stops and has a forceful attitude the way it's progressing. It doesn't care if it could be wrong or causes harm, it just moves, moves, moves. It is a special type of madness to be feared, but not shunned. Embrace this madness, learn to play, and dance with it into pure genius. The madness is a lightning bolt electrifying you with energy for an uncertain amount of time. It is a type of God-given caffeine. Your madness should shock you a little. Use it well while it is there. Use more commas. More run-on sentences. Deal with the aftermath later. In fact, don't even deal with the aftermath at all if you don't want to. Don't even edit anything you're embarrassed about. Just keep going. Don't look back or stop to check anything. Just keep going as long as you can. Run until you're completely out of breath. It should feel as though you are having heart palpitations in a good way. You may or may not make it out alive, but that's not the point of greatness. What really matters is that you just keep going. You owe it to everyone around you. Free Speech and Writing One of my favorite aspects of writing is that I honestly believe free speech is only really present in the written form anymore. You can certainly still say offensive things or push the envelope, however you want, on podcasts or videos or whatever. But because of how accessible these things are to most people now, you can also make people look bad easily as well. It is very easy to take someone out of context with a video or audio clip and make them seem worse than they really are. In comparison, writing is something that takes more time to truly engage with, and as a result, the people who take the time to actually read what you have to say are less likely to be offended or misconstrue something that you have said. Or, if they read your work a lot, they might be likely to get your sense of humor 
and you are able to win them over in that way. The other thing about writing is that most people don't really read anymore because they're stupid. So the people who do read what you have to say are more inclined to be actually slightly more thoughtful than the average person scrolling through whatever app that they're addicted to. Not that I think reading automatically makes a person smart, but that's another topic. Of course, even in writing, you are not really safe from people who wish you harm in the manner of canceling or doing a this you to you. And someone can always screenshot your work to share for wider audiences of people that you didn't really intend on being noticed by. Writing is not a perfect medium for expression by any means, and you are still vulnerable to enemies, but I do believe that you have more of a safeguard from this type of malicious behavior in general if you're a writer. Free speech might not ever really be a thing that is ever truly awarded to the average person anymore, because you always have to watch what you're saying in some manner to preserve your resources. Unless you're incredibly wealthy, and it doesn't matter. But writing is one of the last real places you can say what you feel. The only real downside to this, aside from people potentially screenshotting certain passages of your work, as I already mentioned, is that whatever your message is won't be reached to as wide of an audience compared to to other forms of content that appeal to the lowest common denominator, such as video. However, like I said, this downside isn't really a downside at all, if you think about it, because you are more likely to attract quality people who are in on the joke, so to speak. I think, generally speaking, with most forms of content now, no one is really listening to you, even if you have their attention, and it seems that way. Because most people are dumb, and just sort of absentmindedly taking stuff in passively. When people watch movies, for example, they have their phone out, or they're doing something else. The movie is a background thing they're not really engaging with until it's time to, and something important happens. At which point... They have now seen the controversial moment, or whatever it is they're supposed to notice. With reading, it requires a bit more logic, interpretation, and engaging of something contextually in its entirety. You arguably won't really be able to understand a passage of something in the same way you will be able to get the gist of something from a two-minute clip, and no... And Therefore, no one makes the effort. I have always enjoyed being able to do very offensive things in writing for these reasons. Almost no one is paying attention anyway, so you can pretty much get away with whatever you want. It doesn't really matter to me if I'm not getting the same attention I would from making a video of the same type of joke, because the format of it would change, and it wouldn't be the same thing, necessarily. When something is written, the offensive nature is less offensive, to a certain extent, because you have to use your brain to read it. It kind of feels like a private joke, instead of something on TikTok, where a girl is shaking her ass in your face, or showing you her gaping asshole, and it's set to loud music, etc. Writing, to me, is a classier version of doing the same thing, and people have forgotten that to a certain extent. Don't do what feels bad. I've noticed that a very obviously dumb thing people do is engage in activities that are harmful to them, and then wonder why they feel so bad. I know this sounds really dumb to write out, but it's just another one of those things that is true and happens anyway. There are various examples I could give you, and capitalism in general is probably the easiest and best one. Everything is broken, and people complain every day. 
yet we all continue to support this system instead of taking a stand and all deciding to quit our jobs in mass protests, etc. Yes, I know it's more complicated than that due to mass organization on that level worldwide being highly unlikely. But you can see where I'm going still. Anyway, another obvious example would be regarding drug addictions or bad habits in general. It is astounding to me that so many people have unhealthy behaviors, know that what they're doing is bad for them, and again, they continue to do it every day. It is a very dark and insidious type of sickness in that these people know they are making the wrong choice, but they can't stop doing it. It doesn't even feel good anymore. They just do certain things to feel normal, and they keep doing it to maintain that level of normalcy. So the cycle continues, and then they feel guilty for not getting better, and so on. The solution is so obvious and would be so easy to change things, but they don't want to do it. Simply just stop doing what makes you feel bad for long enough to realize that it's bad. Not the only way to live. Figure out something better, and then live that way. It's really that simple. You don't even need a million dollars to do it. All it takes is willpower, which you have control of inside of you. It's kind of crazy to me that people will figure out one thing that works at a very early point in their life, and then they'll just do that forever. Instead of figuring out multiple things that work and attacking a problem from various angles, they will stick to the one thing they figured out at 14, such as indulging in weed, and never mature past that stage ever again. The problem is that most people who fall into these destructive patterns don't really want to put in that first week of pain that will lead to the overall pleasure that comes from self-improvement. Excessive weed use, for example, is one that people will engage in for extended periods of time, despite not even getting high anymore, for the sole fact that without it, they wouldn't be able to fall asleep for that first week. These people could easily get into exercise and working so hard at something else it helps them fall asleep easier, but they choose to cope with this idea that they need weed to fall asleep, and they keep repeating the same retarded behavior. Some people do this for years, or their entire lives, before they figure out their mistake. That's how dumb people can be. A sad reality about this concept is that whatever substance they're using or addiction they're succumbing to also happens to be clouding their logic at the same time it is giving them their dopamine. So it's like the reward center in their brains are conflicted with this bad thing that is actually ruining their life, making them feel good at the same time. It's like some kind of weird S&M relationship that a lot of people are not aware they're in until a lot of time has gone by, or maybe never. You can see this pattern in other areas, not just with regard to substances. Poor dieting and consumption of bad media is another great example of what I'm talking about. People will sit and watch 13 hours of some TV show in one day, something that wasn't even possible to do at the time the show was originally aired and not intended to be consumed that way and then wonder why they feel so unhealthy. They're not lifting weights. They're not going for walks. There's no exercising happening. And yet they use exercise words like marathon to describe their viewing habits. It's sick, twisted, satanic behavior that is doing them damage and they somehow twist it and distort it like it's a positive thing. Disgusting. I think what happens to a lot of people is the dopamine in their brain becomes so fried after a while, they only really know one way of life. 
the way they have personally chosen to create for themselves. They get so used to feeling terrible on a daily basis, they don't realize another way is possible, and they've normalized feeling bad to such an extent they're unaware of it. The best way I have found to get out of this is to just completely remove yourself from your regular life and dopamine detox, as they say, slash fast from your entire way of life for a while. This is the only way to truly reset your brain and give yourself some perspective. You need to distance yourself from your regular life and routine. This doesn't just mean substances, I mean everything. Take a break from living your life the way you usually do it for a while, and I guarantee you will see differences. You might hate certain things in your life, and you only realize you hate them once you've, once you've given yourself this type of clarity. There's a reason why Nietzsche liked walking so much and why fasting is such a big thing in religion. Both give you time to think and distance yourself from your regular thought patterns and life. Two friends. There is a funny experience I've had a few times in my life. One of those dumb little moments I'm sure you've known yourself. The type of thing that happens, you don't think about it too much, and even if you do, you move on fairly quickly because it's not that important, despite being slightly thought-provoking. There have been times when I walk past two people meeting up who are greeting each other in public. The warm feeling of recognition comes over them, and they are happy to meet their fellow man and comrade. There is a knowing sort of love there. But none of it is for you. You just happen to be there when it happens to see it. This is something I find humorous and can't quite place why. These two people in this instance are humans together, members of a tribe, and you are not. Even though you're near them, you're the same species. You are nothing but a passing obstacle in the way of their camaraderie. It's as if you're a little monster. You're inhumane and getting in the way of humanity. Whenever something like this occurs, even though I have my own friends and my own tribe, I feel naked. For a brief moment, I feel like I'm nothing. There's a flip side to this as well. I wonder how many times I may have made someone else feel bad in a similar manner. Why is there always one person left out in this scenario. It should be that all of humanity is friends with each other. No segregation or shunning. Everyone is known by at least one other person at all times. That's how it should be. But it's not like that. In life, there are times you are anonymous among groups of people who all know each other like Tom Cruise in Eyes Wide Shut at the party. <laughs> inspiration doesn't matter. Sometimes I have to remind myself that inspiration, and whether or not I personally feel like working that day, is completely meaningless to the end goal and work itself. How I feel the day I make something is immaterial in the grand scheme of life. I honestly believe that in some ways, the same type of work would get done regardless of if the artist was inspired or not. That doesn't really matter. The only thing that matters is that you actually did it, and you don't wait for anything. You just get to work. Inspiration is a myth. Mysteries. There is a certain way mysteries are often portrayed in pop culture that may not always be true. It's the classic scenario in which the detective is actively searching for the clues and pursuing the case. The mystery 
won't get solved unless this detective goes after it. But then there's another, less popular way mysteries are portrayed in pop culture. Where the main character is just stumbling through the mystery, and it gets solved anyway. Films like The Big Lebowski and Inherent Vice are both great examples of what I'm talking about. The main character in both films isn't even a detective, or at least not in the traditional sense. Doc Sportello, an inherent vice, is barely a detective. He works out of a doctor's office. His pursuit of the Shasta case isn't so much about what he finds, but about what finds him. In other words, even if he were to stop searching, the case might still get solved. I think this is a great example of what a mystery often looks like in real life and why I enjoy these two films so much. Real life is not like a typical mystery movie. We aren't detectives. There's no case. In real life, stuff just kind of happens and that's it. Not everything gets resolved. I like this type of mystery more because it feels more real. In reality, you often do not seek out new and revealing information. It is organically dropped on you, and you may be lured into solving something accidentally. But it it's not like it wouldn't have gotten solved if you didn't search for it. Do you know what I'm trying to say here? I don't even know if this one makes sense, but... <laughs> In some ways... That is the better approach. Letting life and its mystery do its thing, rather than force something that doesn't want to come to fruition yet. The more you try, the worse some mysteries get. Male versus female horniness. Something that has always bothered me is women who think they understand what being horny is like for a man. It is something they will never ever truly understand. Because for a woman, desire is fun. It's a good time and a healthy part of a balanced breakfast. It's all fun and games if you're a woman. If you're a man, it's different. Sexuality is like a sickness. It's not something you're proud of as a guy. It's something that should disturb and shock you, because I think it makes you less of a man. For a woman, they can own their sexuality, and it makes them better people, probably. For men, it makes us worse. During puberty, it consumes their hormonal brains, which is why most teenage boys are so goofy and immature, because it's all they can think about, literally. For men, Sexuality is a torturous thing. It's like a disease they have to work on beating. Off. (laughs) I am 31 at the time of writing this, and I am happy I am no longer a younger man. In fact, I look forward to the day when my testosterone and that side of me is almost completely gone, so I can focus properly on other things fully without having to let thoughts of that nature disrupt my life. I have acted in ways that were incredibly foolish in hindsight, and I'm glad it didn't end up with me getting someone pregnant or losing my life, or getting AIDS, or stabbed in the face, or shot in the face, or punched in the face, etc. When you're a guy, it sometimes feels like there's a smart version of you being clouded or haunted by a dumber guy intent on a whole other path, and he can destroy you if you're not careful. I don't think women realize how difficult it can be for men, and I wouldn't wish this disease on anyone. This is something that bothered me about the cultural conversation surrounding the Me Too movement and what was missing from it. Male sympathy (laughs) as funny as that sounds no one talked about how men who are mostly good people can sometimes be hijacked by their own desires 
that make them demons. Now, I am not excusing poor behavior here. I'm just saying that society needs to address the fact that men suffer too. <laughs> Instead of pretending that we are sexless eunuchs. It feels like society has swung so hard in favor of women in the past few years that it's now impolite to even talk about the differences of this kind of stuff and male sexuality anymore. The government must step in and assign prostitutes for every man as soon as he turns 18 in order to learn what sex is in a healthy manner so he can move forward as a society if you want to compartmentalize <laughs> in this way. Sexual education from a frumpy teacher who hasn't gotten laid since Richard Nixon was president should be a thing of the past. We need to properly educate our young men in ways that are modern, in ways that work. Otherwise, I suspect there will probably be a Me Too movement in the year 3017 as well. History will repeat itself if we don't make the necessary changes. We need to assign prostitutes to all... <laughs> in some ways, I look at sexuality now like it's a disability or a curse. I guess you need it to a certain extent because that drive is there to tell you to be a better person and motivate you to do real things. But in today's world, it's like an appendix. It manifests itself in just getting laid or, or just masturbation, etc. It's a what used to be a helpful energy that has been turned into a wasteful energy abusive one microphones the modern man uses a sure microphone and has nothing to say men of the past used to travel conquer walk the earth they used to fight wars they'd go to work read great books argue with their wives the men of the past would develop their voices and would say nothing until turning 50. The modern man buys a $5,000 microphone and has absolutely zero to say. He purchases the home studio podcaster DIY package, works on a soundproof room in his home, faces the world, and forgets one crucial factor. He doesn't even know the world. The modern man is a philosopher with no ideas. He is a storyteller with no stories to tell. He's never lived a full life. But be sure to tune in every Friday wherever you listen to your podcasts to listen to him talk about absolutely nothing.